The first African-American naval officer's struggle for equal civil rights and responsibilities served as an important step forward in the fight for racial equality. The Golden Thirteen, Civic Responsibility Before Self The attack on Pearl Harbor shocked the American public. President Roosevelt called upon all Americans to serve the war effort and defeat the Axis powers. In a fireside chat, he told the American people that the war would test us to the utmost, for never before have we been called upon for such a prodigious effort with so little time to do so much. Despite the bravery of African Americans in all of America's previous wars, and the tremendous need for men to fight, the Selective Service Act expressly forbade the intermingling of colored and white draftees. Even blood supplies for saving the lives of the wounded were kept separate. Blacks were barred from frontline combat and asked instead to perform menial tasks in uniform. In the words of George Cooper, Jim Crow was the name of the game. Everything was separate. Nothing was equal. Official communication indicated a preference for the unspoiled young Negroes of the South for use in the military over northern blacks, who were more independent and educated. The Navy insisted that Negro exclusion from general enlistment serves the best interests of the Navy, the country, and themselves. In 1942, African American civic leaders launched the Double Victory Campaign for victory over fascism abroad and victory over discrimination at home. African American demonstrations of patriotic responsibility and their efforts to support the war demanded the government's promotion of equal rights. Political pressure prompted the War Department to revise race restrictions for service, but discrimination persisted. In the Navy, African American volunteers received training in segregated camps and schools, served in segregated units, and worked in construction battalions, supply depots, ordnance stations, and harbor yards. Two years after Executive Order 8802 prohibited racial discrimination in the national defense, and under the continual pressure of requests from Secretary of the Navy Adlai Stevenson and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, the Navy instituted an officer training course, selecting 16 African-American enlisted men from a pool of thousands. Training officer Lieutenant Small stated, They were good leaders, not radical, picked because we could count on them to benefit the Navy and not raise racial issues. Frank Sublett, one of those selected, shared, I just wanted to do the best I could, but you had to be twice as good as the whites in order to pass. Similarly, George Cooper described the high-pressure environment of officer training. They were representing not just themselves, but the more than 100,000 black personnel in the Navy at that time. Jesse W. Arbor, Samuel Barnes, Philip Barnes, Dalton Bowe, George C. Cooper, Reginald Goodwin, James E. Hare, Graham E. Martin, Dennis Nelson, John W. Reagan, Frank E. Sublett Jr., William S. White, Charles Lear, Lewis Williams, J.B. Pinckney, and A. Alves banded together during the grueling training, avoiding the efforts of those around them to inhibit their unprecedented progress. Hare recalled that, We were under a lot of pressure, and we had to operate as controlled individuals. We would get many insults, and it was understood that if we reported any incidents, the white trainees would get disciplined, but we might get thrown out. Barnes shared, we were determined not to fail, and followed the motto, all for one and one for all. We knew that we were the foot in the door for many other black sailors, and we were determined not to be the ones who were responsible for having that foot removed. The group earned a record 3.89 class average on the final exam. Officials couldn't believe the results, and ordered them to be reevaluated twice. Each time, the 16 repeated their results, setting a record that still stands today. Only 12, however, were commissioned as ensigns, with one more man kept on as a warrant officer. The Navy never provided reasons for the rejections they made, but some suggest that they didn't want a black officer group to be seen as outperforming their white counterparts. The new officers soon discovered that their impressive rank did not entitle them to the same rights or responsibilities enjoyed by white officers. At the brief meeting to distribute their ensign shoulder boards, the men were informed that they would not have access to the officers' club. Navy policy also prevented them from serving on combatant ships. Nine of the thirteen became instructors, and the remaining four were appointed to yard and harbor craft duty. Without explanation, the Bureau of Naval Personnel labeled them Deck Officers Limited, a designation usually reserved for officers whose mental or physical deficiencies kept them from performing all the duties of a line officer. None of the thirteen, however, had any such handicaps. When Martin and Sublet arrived for patrol craft duty off Alcatraz, their all-white crew was quickly replaced with a black one. Martin noted that there was support, recalling, I had one white man under me who didn't want to leave, but orders were orders. 
1944, Barnes was sent to a supply transport unit. He has fond memories of the white officers in his unit, noting, We ate together and slept together, and there was never any feelings of uneasiness. Stationed in Guam, Jesse Arbor discovered a Navy investigator following him, recording his conduct and activities as one of the first black naval officers. John Reagan became an instructor at the Hampton Naval Training Institute, and recalled that his job was to show up in classes and show these young black enlisted men that they did have something to aspire to. The irony was that I personally did not have much of a job to go with my impressive new uniform and rank, because a white officer taught the class. In 1944, Life magazine ran First Negro Ensigns, in the same issue as the editorial Negro Rights, demonstrating a newfound responsibility for minorities with equal rights. The article in the Navy emphasized the officer's education, respectable pre-war professions, and assignments to all African-American crews. The editorial argued that, in the midst of a war for freedom abroad, the South's efforts to prevent African-Americans from voting is creating the number one social problem, with Negroes being so outspokenly bitter about America's refusal to give them equal status. Despite the efforts of civil rights activists and African-American servicemen, victory abroad did not bring immediate victory at home over discrimination. However, black veterans would play a crucial role in the post-war struggle for civil rights. The end of the war initiated the process of integration. Recalled to duty in 1949, Lieutenant John Reagan found that he was asked more than once, Can a Negro be anything other than a mess cook? By 1953, however, Reagan, a division officer of a nearly all-white unit, claimed, I no longer felt that I was a token. Now I felt part of the Navy. Instead of being embittered by discrimination, the 13 officers believed that they had a responsibility to advance the civil rights of others facing prejudice. Well, they were a, a, a image for us to uphold. But all of us kind of looked back to the Golden 13, um, uh, as as um, those that, that open the door. Um, and it's our job to open that door of opportunity a little bit more for each successive group. Their choices of civilian careers in education, engineering, business, social work, and law illustrate their civic responsibility. George Cooper shared, I have a responsibility to do whatever I can to help somebody else. Barnes reported, I realized that I should use my own experiences to affect the lives of young people in a positive way. Any success in my own life is because somebody helped me along the way. Jesse Arbor reports that his legacy can be seen in each African American naval officer that has followed him. We learn to walk so that the ones behind us could run, he says. If, if it wasn't for the Goldman 13, I wouldn't be here. Um, I would not be an officer today because they were the tra trailblazers that took, took, they took all the hardships and all the, you know, the, all the discrimination so I could be here. The Golden Thirteen, as they were aptly termed by the Navy years after their service in World War II, proved to be role models of honor and distinguished service, quickly making an impact in the Navy. By the end of the war, 64 African Americans were Navy officers. In 1949, Wesley A. Brown became the first black graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. In 1966, Admiral J. Paul Reason became the first black naval officer to earn four stars commanding the Atlantic Fleet. A former vice admiral, Samuel Gravely, said of the struggles of blacks in the Navy, You are responsible somehow in order to make a difference. It's your responsibility. When asked if everything endured by the Golden Thirteen is worth it, George Cooper responded, when you see good-looking, obviously bright, up-and-coming African-American naval officers, then you realize that it was without question worthwhile to do it. Current Lieutenant Candace Holmes stated, Many of us are able to succeed in the Navy today because they paved the way, and set a standard each of us can aspire to meet. The Golden Thirteen provided an example to many that they did not have to accept the oppressive impositions of white society on their lives. They could overcome them through hard work and perseverance and make something of themselves. These folks, uh, the Golden Thirteen, have left a legacy, one that I certainly appreciate, one that I certainly wouldn't be here had it not been for them. To date, the Golden Thirteen Scholarship, started by George Cooper, has awarded $14,000 to African-American ROTC students enrolled in one of the six traditionally black colleges operating naval ROTC units.